Today, I'll be speaking with Shanghai Kate Helenbrand. Shanghai Kate is known as the godmother of tattooing. She's been voted one of the most influential people in tattoo history. She has an award-winning lecture, Voodoo to Vogue, and is author of several books. Kate was the first female tattooist to make it commercially without being exploited. Tattooing was illegal back then in New York, and she started in the underground in a time when it was guarded by the godfathers of tattooing. Kate was apprenticed by Sailor Jerry Collins, and I've been fortunate to have a tattoo from Kate with Sailor Jerry's machine when I flew all the way to Austin, Texas, just to meet her. We worked on an article together for Skin Deep Tattoo magazine, and I'm really proud to welcome Shanghai Kate to Eternal Clothing. Welcome to the show, Shanghai <coughs> Kate Ellen Brand. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today, Fid Meraki. Meraki, Fid. Great to see you. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. I miss you. Yeah, it's been too long. I think it's been a couple yeah. of years since I could visit. So yeah. I look forward to coming over again. Well, I'd love to speak to you about tattoo history and, and what it was like when you began tattooing. So Sure. Yeah, so I was wondering what it was like when you started tattooing in New York, because I understand that it was illegal at the time. Yes. Yes, it had been underground for about 30 years. <clears throat> well, not quite that much, about 20 years. Uh, but uh, that's one of the reasons that I was able to survive uh, with the climate of women being in tattooing. It's uh, very difficult and it's becoming even more troublesome now. Uh, but uh, nobody saw me. Nobody knew that I was tattooing because it was underground. I couldn't advertise. I couldn't, um, you know, spread my word very much. I mean, just it was local friends and people that I knew, you know, friends of other friends. And so I was, um, I was uh, protected from all of the prejudicial uh, fear of uh, men not wanting women to tattoo because women were always the tattoo artists from the dawn of time. Uh, I read a good quote recently that said, you know, tattooing has been around longer than farming, longer than um, agriculture or domestic pets, you know, and it predates even that. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the most, act most primitive activities that so uh, humans do, and they do it in, uh, in every, um, Oops, I lost my ear. <laughs> um, they do it in every culture. And men never tattooed. They dressed up and put flowers in their hair and feathers in their hair. And, you know, they made war on neighboring territories so that they could expand their territories. Um, but men were never the decorators of their culture. Um, women were. And so it was always a woman's art. And so, you know, and women take to it very um, easily and and clients take to women tattooing them very easily because women are shamanistic women uh, are a, a connection to the um, to the source and uh, you know we're creatures of mystery and that's one thing that happened to me though is that when I started tattooing I was working with Michael Malone and uh you know, there were not very many tattoo artists back in the day, and uh, and they were all underground. So you didn't see their work unless you knew them personally or you had a personal invite. <clears throat> and so when I came out, I had a, an art background. And so I heard recently from a tattoo artist who works in um, Rhode Island or New Hampshire or one of those areas up north, that when I, uh, when people started hearing about me and I came out to, you know, hiding, I guess. Um, I terrified the men. They were terrified of me um, because I was so much better than they were. And they didn't, I, they didn't know this animal that was a woman that was tattooing in their ranks. And then the clients also had a problem sometimes with me. Didn't think I was strong enough to mm -hmm. tattoo that, you know, it was something like lifting, you know, bales of, pipe or something you know it's just a sit down you have a little machine in your hand and you draw and and uh, I guess it was so conceived you know it was perceived as something that 
took a lot of inner strength to do. And Lord knows I have that. So um, I was not about to um, be dissuaded. Once I picked up a tattoo machine and knew what it was, I, I just fell into that magic realm of no uh, conscience, no, uh, not conscience of behavior. You know, there's, there's no, uh, uh, just it became this zone where I was doing something creative where I got lost. And I think that's where everybody who has a creative bend, who has a creative outlet, tries to get to. They try to get there. And I can get there anytime I pick up that little machine. Yeah. And so to me, I was just like, this is it. This is the magic realm. And so I was passionate about it. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of resistance from Malone about me tattooing because I was better than he was. And he was, he was defensive and frightened. And, uh, and a lot of other people were. My greatest advocate was Tom DeVita. And, uh, you know, he used to say things to Michael like, Kate just did the best tattoo I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, and he was working with Huck Spalding, you know. Paul Rogers had worked on him too. So that was high praise. And, uh, and so that was just another nail in the coffin of uh, Malone's resistance for me tattooing. Because when people say stuff like that to a man of a shallow ego, it, it uh, terrifies them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So you've been trailblazing since the start, it sounds like. I'm a trailblazer. I'll tell you, my, I come from a long line of them. Uh, my yeah. family are Utah pioneers, and uh, they came across the mountain in the covered wagons and wow. founded little towns in Utah. And uh, so I've always had that passion. I've always had that curiosity. I've always wanted to know what's on the other side of the mountain. I always wanted to you know, see new stuff. I didn't want to uh, just take the, I had the opportunity to take the, you know, the uh, quote unquote, you know, the accepted female role, but I refused like, okay, one story is, you know, I always worked outside and I worked on the tractor and I lit, slept with the animals and uh, <clears throat> I was a little cowgirl and uh I always dressed the part. And so uh, one night when I was about eight years old, my mother said, okay, it's time for you to learn how to be, you know, to take care of woman's stuff. She, she said, you're not going to go on the tractor today. She said, I want you to wash the dishes. Wow. I'd never washed the dishes. So I, in defiance, picked up all the, there were eight of us, picked up all the dinner plates and just threw them on the floor and smashed them. Huh. And my mother said, that's the last time I ever ask you to do the dishes. Get on the tractor. And so that was I found the, yeah, I found the way to get out back out there. So yeah, I didn't I didn't learn to cook until I was in Hawaii and uh, probably in the, the mid 70s. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You've traveled a lot. You've traveled a lot. I heard that you had your exhibitions in New York when you were beginning to tattoo and then you went out around the world from there. Is that right? Yeah. Michael Malone and I were photographing everything that we could find about tattooing. We, we were little pioneers going out and, you know, investigating tattooing as a culture in New York City. If they were underground we were going to find them and we did and we pho photographed a lot of them and then we we graduated from the five boroughs of new york and went out to other cities on the east coast uh boston and uh, was uh, washington dc and you know various places where other tattoo artists were hanging out chicago we first took our first road trip was to meet cliff raven in chicago and uh, we both got our um, our first original, you know, our real tattoos in Chicago from Cliff and Michael was, uh, had arranged it in advance with Cliff that he was going to get a little demon head on his shoulder. And I was sitting uh, in the room and I was looking at all the flash and I wanted to see, you know, I didn't know what I wanted. And I saw a little clipper ship 
teeny little clipper ship about that big. And I thought that would be really cute on the top of my thigh because I was a surfer then and I was in pretty good shape. So that would be very cute on the top of my thigh to represent my love of the, you know, horizons and freedom and my curiosity, and, you know, pay honor to that. And uh, so I said, well, that's what I want. And they said, no, you can't get that. And I said, what do you mean I can't get that? And they said, that's a man's design. You mm -hmm. can't get that tattoo. This is in 1972. They said, only men get that tattoo design. Women get butterflies or flowers or uh, skunks or squirrels uh, on their butts. That's what they get. I mean, you could get a you could get these little tattoos somewhere else other than your butt. But most women got them on their butt because if you had a tattoo, you were seen as a fallen woman, and so they wanted to hide them. And so I, but I didn't want to hide one. I didn't want to hide mine. So the the little skunk that they advised that I get was named Stinky, and I'm like, I'm not getting a skunk named Stinky on me. Yeah. And so. Uh, they said, uh, well, you can get flowers. So I got cherry blossoms from Cliff Raven, which is still, I got a great tattoo from Cliff Raven, but I couldn't get the one I wanted. It wasn't until maybe 30 years, 40 years later that Zeke Owen, who, when I got to California, was the biggest um, opponent for me tattooing. He hated women tattooing. He, he was cut from the cloth of Sailor Jerry and... Uh, and that women should never tattoo and and, uh, and so but he came to work for me uh, over the years he became a good friend of mine and uh, <clears throat> he considered me his sister and so when, when I had a shop in Buffalo he came to work with me and he uh, it was snowing that day and Buffalo was normal and uh, he asked what did I want to do and I said I want you to tattoo me Zeke and he said what do you want and I said I want my clipper ship and he said, where do you want it? And I said, I want it on my man spot. This area right here was considered the man spot. And so two hours later, I got my clipper ship from Cliff Raven. That's awesome. What a story as well. What a, what a time you had to wait for it and journey had to go through to get that man to, tattoo. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that you, things that are worth having are worth waiting for. So I have a history of waiting for stuff. Yeah, I'm very patient. And that's something else you have to have in, in uh, tattooing. You have to have patience. Women have a lot of patience. We wait nine months to have a baby. You know, that's a, a lot of patience there, right there. So. Wow. Yeah, I'm so. fortunate to share the tattoo with you when I visited in your tattoo studio. You told me that story and I just thought, well, that's the one that I want from you. <laughs> so did yeah. I tattoo a stinker on stinky on you? No, you did the clipper ship. I can probably show you. Oh here. yeah, the clipper ship. That's it. See, With Taylor Jerry's machine just here. <laughs> there you go. So we've we've got some exciting news. We're going to um, cast the Sailor Jerry machines. Wow, we're already at the foundry. Yeah, because I have the mold for the original frame. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're going to make the Sailor Jerry machines. That's awesome. Oh, I definitely I know. order one. That's so cool. Yeah. How's it going with your tattoo museum? Because I saw all your acetates and handwritten letters between yourself and Sailor Jerry and people like that. Have you documented things more and got your books going? Um, no, not very much. I write a chapter here and there when I'm... Uh, when I'm inspired and they're little stories, but I don't know how I'm going to tackle this project because there's so much to say. Mm. There's so many stories to tell. Whenever I went anywhere, I, I said, you know, don't treat me any differently because I'm a girl, you know, uh, just treat me like I'm one of the guys. That's all. Mm -hmm. So then Jack Rudy said, when I went to tattoo land to work with them, he said, Oh, you want to be one of the guys do you? He said, okay, well, then you're going to learn to pee standing up because that's what guys do. <laughs> none, of the sit, none of this sitting down to pee. You've got to stand up and pee because that's what we do. So um, I had to learn to pee standing up for Jack. 
Wow. And now he says, oh, no, that wasn't my idea. That was your idea. And I, <laughs> said, I said, yeah, Jack, that's what that was my idea to pee down my legs in a pool in front of the toilet, trying to make noise enough that you could hear it and think that I was peeing in the toilet standing up. <laughs> yeah, it comes in handy on a camping trip, but um, or long road trips. But yeah, but it, it was something that was unnecessary. But I went along with it because, you know, I was going to be one of the guys and you can't just, you know, pull up your panties and stomp off and say, you know, you've insulted me. You yeah. know, there was no insult. There was no insult in that. It was just, you know, if you pass off some of this, I mean, I've had a lot of um, sexual attention over the years from clients and uh, you just have to learn how to put it in its place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I imagine you faced a lot of challenges being, you know, first female commercial tattooist to make it successfully without being exploited. I've heard all kinds of stories of what things were like back then and things about oh. thumbs being threatened to cut off and crazy stories. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I'm, I was, I worked with really great people like Bill Funk and <clears throat> Wes Wood at Sacred Tattoo. And, you know, I worked, I did my route with bikers. I went to Sturgis several times and, you know, I, uh, I'm good friends with the Hells Angels. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm an associate of the Hells Angels is what they put on my police record, I think. But <laughs> um, they, uh, you know, women, um have to learn to on one hand lighten up and on the other hand demand respect so it's as it's a uh, uh teetotter uh, you know so it's a balancing act that has to be yeah um followed and i think that if you're too precious to get into this business then maybe you know, you need to find a studio that will support you and and, uh, and guide you through this because it can be very, very intimidating. That's right. Yeah, I remember my teacher when I was apprenticing, his motto was, it's not a fucking nail bar, <laughs> which what he meant by that was just come in and get on with it. It's not, you know, it's not like that. Yeah. Come in and be you because you're already enough and... Yeah, just get on with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best thing to do. That's it. Yeah. 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 Make that money. <laughs> money, 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 money. <laughs> I was never about the money. No. I was never about the money. But a lot of the men were. A lot of people were. Yeah. That I've worked with. It attracts the wrong people to tattooing. I think if you're money motivated, then you're not going to be producing the best artwork coming from a place of passion. And right. you know, with a, a really good exchange with your client as well, I think those kind of things can cloud the process. Obviously, it helps getting paid, but you know, right. getting paid well. But you know, it's not about that either, is it? <laughs> no, yeah. no. To keep perspective, like once a month, I would give a tattoo away just for free. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't charge uh, to somebody who really wanted one mm -hmm. but couldn't afford it. You know, yeah. or and. Uh, so I would say, come on, I'll do it for you. I mean, it's 15 minutes, half an hour, so, mm -hmm. you know, but it makes, it means the world to them and it, it's good for business. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to ask you what it was like being Sailor Jerry's apprentice. I've seen his dividers and things like that on the wall in your studio and I've always been mesmerized. What was that part <laughs> of your journey like? You know, I was so new and I was so young and I was so frightened. Um, <laughs> You know, I had just started tattooing and I was just dumped in, you know, we, Michael and I did the show at the Museum of American Folk Art and we, we wanted to uh, document the best tattooing going on in New York, not in New York globally, but we put it on the walls of the museum in New York City because there was nothing about tattooing. You know, it was, uh, it was the Museum of American Folk Art was going to do, um, a museum show and I asked what they were going to do it about and they said well we have paintings of ships 
And I'm like, well, that's not really tattooing. So um, I volunteered Michael and I to, uh, I took Michael in and his photographs and um, I volunteered us to join that project. And then I wound up um, working with the museum and then they gave us a whole room of our own for a contemporary look at you know, tattooing in America at that time. And that's where most of our photographs wound up. And Jerry always felt that his art was museum quality. And uh, certainly it was. It might not be fine art, but it was, you know, a big step in cultural art. And, uh, and so when we put his work on the museum wall, it elevated him to a point that he felt he should be. And so out of gratitude, he invited Michael and me and uh, Ed Hardy and Des Conley, the guy who worked on his machines for him way back in the day, and uh, Jerry's shop girl, Mick, and, and Jerry himself. And it was called the Council of the Seven. And it was the first, oh, and Kazuo Ogori. It was the first uh, international meeting of tattoo artists that had ever been held. And so it was a week at his house. And, uh, and so that, that was the grease that lubricated my entry into Jerry's circle, because he was just as adamant against women tattooing as anybody could be. Yeah. And, uh, and he was, he didn't like Japanese people either, but he loved Kazuo Rory and he didn't like young hippies, but he was fond of Ed Hardy and, you know, Z Cohen. So he had prejudices, but he was willing to overlook them if he met people who were good representatives of that class. And, uh, and so he embraced me. And by the time that convention was over, um, he was talking about opening a shop with me uh, in Hawaii because Ed Hardy had stabbed him in the back and run off with Kazuo Gori and the enemy. Uh, Jerry hated the Japanese because of Pearl Harbor. And so um, Jerry fought in World War II and um, he just didn't like the Japanese for some cultural reason, but he loved the Chinese. And so that enabled him to cross you know, that line, learn the, some of the languages and stuff. And so he hated Japanese, but he embraced Kazuo. He hated women, but he loved me, you know, hated young surfers, but he loved Ed and Zeke. So he walked that line all the time to, um, you know, to overcome his prejudices and learn from us and become, you know, our mentor. And uh, so when I wound up at Jerry's house, having this lubricated entry, um, he was like my father. He was like a father figure to me. He was, um, he was a hard man. He was a, a <clears throat> raspy man. He was, you know, an old salt. And uh, he played that role really well. But he was also a genius. And he played that role well. And so he was... He was terrifying, and yet he was lovely. Mm -hmm. That's uh, all I can say about it. Huh? Well-rounded. <laughs> yeah, he was very well-rounded. Yeah. He was married, and he had children, and he was, you know, uh, an inventor. He was, he was rough. He was rough on himself. Um, he would knock his teeth out with chopsticks if they were rotting in his head. Um, he cured his own skin cancer by taking the cancer medicine because his wife was a nurse and he would get her to bring it home from the hospital. And then he would take the stuff that you're supposed to inject and he would tattoo it right on the tattoo where the, can the cancer was wow. and he cured his own cancer with that. Wow. So he like yeah. administered it locally or something. He what? He sort of Sorry. administered it himself locally. Into oh yeah. He just... Yeah. Yeah, just tattooed it right on the, wow. the wound, on the tumor, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah, cured his own cancer. Wow. That's so great. he's uh, he wrote the the next book that I'm going to do. I do the his book, which is kind of a a um, uh, it's kind of a 
light sailor jerry light book where he uh you know talks about tattooing and how he hates women in it and how he hates the japanese and how he hates young hippies and all that stuff but <laughs> the next book that he that i have a group of papers are um his license for getting a, uh, his applications for getting a license in tattooing in hawaii he wrote those laws and uh what you had to know in order to be a good tattoo artist about skin and about the chemicals that we use and so forth and um and so that's the next book i'm going to put out in the scientific papers see mm -hmm. if anybody can chew those up and digest them yeah that sounds awesome i'd love to read yeah. those and you already published one book with Sailor Jerry. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but I have a video of you reading it so telling me it's Sailor Jerry's Bedtime Stories. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the actual title. I've not got it at hand. Yeah, the his book. Uh, it was his, uh, his late night musing, sort of like what I do. Uh, his late night musing of how to write a book and just, you know, spilling his beans. Um, and then... Uh, then I have the two books of his stencil designs. That's where it all started. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. And you've tattooed in Hawaii for several years. And did you work in Shanghai as well? No, I've never been to China or Japan. I would love to I'm make a movie with you as well about tattoo history and try and document some of the American tattoo history through mm -hmm. the eras of it becoming commercial and all the sailor history and things like that and the Americana old school flash. I think it would be awesome. That's that's when American tattooing really had some balls, you know. Now it's uh now the artwork is incredible, but it's not, you know, I look at some of what's being done now with these pen machines and these uh new pigments and stuff. They don't look like tattoos. They look like airbrushed designs on people. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have that <clears throat> of a tattoo. They're works of art mm -hmm. and um, they're beautiful. And I don't know how they do it, but um, I will never be able to do that because I, I was trained in the Sailor Jerry style. Uh, but I don't know, tattooing, that old school will never lose its place. But at the same time, the lid is blown off of what's possible in tattooing now. And, uh, you know, it's still terrifying that the government wants to get involved in our pigments and, you know, tell us that they're uh, faulty or whatever, you know, even though they've not done any science on it, they've not done any testing on it. Uh, they're just painting it all with a broad brush. And, uh, and Sailor Jerry is the kind of the father of all of the pigments that we have, the dry pigments. And uh, so as soon as he got as enough of a palette, he sent them off to a chemist. And the chemist came back and said, these, these uh, pigments that you sent me are safer than salt mm -hmm. for the human body. Yeah. Well, you know, my husband's tattooing now. Cool. He has a tattoo shop. Yeah. I, don't go, I, don't, I don't go to the tattoo shop. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I'm ready or if I'm not ready or you know, I mean, uh, I still want to get my hands back in shape. Uh, when I think that, you know, I broke my back five times and I uh, broke my tailbone six times. Wow. Broke my ribs, had massive head injuries, you know, a lot of arthritis, took out both knees, you know, to me, uh, my ribs, uh, just from living just mm -hmm. from having a great time running around, falling off the of mountains and, you know, <laughs> slamming my body on the beach when I was surfing, getting run down by wild dogs in Panama. Uh, when I told my doctor that, he said, oh, now you're just making shit up, <laughs> which was pretty funny. I um, can't believe how wild your life is sometimes, can they, when confronted with a living legend? No, <laughs> I don't consider myself that, but... Um, I'm just a little cowgirl out here in Texas, mm -hmm. trying to get trying to get ahead. Uh, but I have had a very colorful 
past. I've had a very rich, colorful past. I'm very lucky that I've had that life, you know, and then I'm very lucky that I, I'm as well put together still as I am now, you know. I have issues, but, you know, I've got, I've had a life that would normally kill somebody, you know, but it's my life. And I mean, I think my attitude is what's really helped me carry me through. I mean, I, I realize now that my husband reminds me almost daily that I'm 78 years old. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's pretty advanced, you know, to be doing what I do. Yeah, you're still looking amazing and still a phenomenal artist. So, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to see the next few years with you. Knees fixed up and we can go run around the world. <laughs> yes, let's do it. That's awesome. I um, got a Disney Channel subscription so that I could watch the series with... Um, Oh, the name. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. I saw yeah. you on the tattoo in a convention. Yeah. That was super fun. He was he was really lovely. Um, I we are friends on Instagram, so he uh, and his wife chat with me a little bit here and there. But yeah, that was fun. He was really um, he was probably, well, he and Howard Stern and Pearl Jam are three of, and Casey Affleck are the, probably the most high <clears throat> profile clients I have. Wow. Had. And Pearl Jam yeah. too. I didn't know that. Yeah. So cool. Wow. Are you still able to tattoo? Obviously, pre pandemic, were you still able to do a few clients? I know you're taking a break now, but. Will you come back to it again? Oh, I have to. It's mm -hmm. it's my life. It's who I am. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I have to come back to it. I just have to get my hands in shape again because of this little stroke that I had from mm -hmm. the an anesthesia from my uh, first knee surgery. Yeah. And I know how to do that. I've had multiple head injuries where I've had... Uh, I've lost, you know, use of my arms or my hands or my hands wobble or whatever. And uh, I've got Alaska here and he just uh, sits on my drawing table while I draw Sailor Jerry designs over and over again and practice and get back to it. Is that like part of your physio to keep drawing, you know, the familiar designs and practice your line work? Yeah. Again? Yeah. For the neural to hand sort of building up those pathways and things. Yeah, the language between those two entities is yeah. still intact. So, yeah, I'll I'll do it again, but I won't do it like they these kids are doing at these airbrush pieces because, my God, I don't even know how to do that, you know. So I'll just embrace my old school foundations and go forward with that. People seem to want that, you know. I have this heritage of, you know. Ed Hardy and Sailor Jerry and Z Cohen. So that will carry me for a while. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people want Kate for being Kate, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of dedicated fans and yeah. I love each and every one of them. <laughs> I, I On my phone, I have all these names of people. You know, I've got like, <clears throat> well, Instagram, no, Facebook gives you a 5,000 friends, and I don't know how many you can have on Instagram, but I, I can look, the, look at that list, and I can remember every person. I can remember why they're on my list, what I did for them, and some anecdote about what we did, you know, that, had, that was fun. You know, I just remember all these things, and so how do I put that in a book? I just... Of course, I don't do all of them in a book, but I mean, I've had some pretty eventful experiences. Yeah. Can you tell us about a little one just before the end of the podcast, a little treasure story? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I've been kidnapped several times. Uh, 
that's always been an interesting highlight. And women, women, women are prey. I mean, you know, we you go out at night and men feel um, comfortable and taking you in a car, you know, doing stuff like that to you. And um, I just, uh, I don't want women to be like men, but um, I can see how these kidnappings can happen and they're, they really are uh, terrifying. <clears throat> um, I've been kidnapped a bunch of times, once by my uncle, once by Ed Hardy, uh, once in a taxi cab in Mexico. Um, and I knew that the taxi cab drivers would kidnap you in Mexico. I had been warned about that. And you should not be out alone in Mexico because they'll take you, put you in a cab. So um, but this one morning at a tattoo convention in Mexico City, I was there with Tony Olivas and uh, Brian Everett, and Jack Rudy and uh, Paul Bruce and a bunch of people. And I was invited to um, join them. So uh, <clears throat> it was Sunday morning and I uh, woke up early and, uh, you know, being a girl in this business, you know, the men are always trying to find some way to, you know, better you to do something, you know, that shows your weakness or your um, frailty. And so I like to get up early and go to the convention before anybody else gets there, any of the guys, because I can make money before they get there and then I can flash them, you know, money and say, oh, you should have been here, you know, you weaklings, you, you know, little fray guys, frail guys. And so um, I got up in the morning at, uh, very early on Sunday. They had all been out drinking the night before, so I knew none of them were getting there early. So I get to the, uh, I, I go to my hotel and I, the little uh, doorman um, grabs my bag and walks me out onto the street and hails a cab. So I get in the cab with him and I had forgotten this lesson I was supposed to learn. And uh, those were supposed to be the worst cabs, the ones that are hailed. And so I got in the cab and the next thing I, I was supposed to go 10 blocks left and Next thing I know, I'm going 100 miles an hour, 10 blocks right on the freeway, just zooming, you know, as the sun is out, there's, you know, it's a beautiful day as usual. And uh, I said, um, where are we going? He said, airport. I said, no, not airport. No, I go to the convention. So he took me back to the hotel. And I went into the concierge and I said, please write down the name and the address of where I'm going. So I can give that to the next cab driver. So he called the cab driver and radio cabs are safer supposedly because there's more of a paper trail for them. Except what happens is the criminals drag the cab drivers out of the cab, beat the crap out of them and then take the cab and then there, there you go. That's how that goes. But um, this uh, cab driver appeared and uh, to take me and uh, I, the first thing, you know, one of the things that women need to get over is empathy. We have so much empathy that we put ourselves at risk mm -hmm. because we don't follow our inner warnings. And so uh, this man's fingers were, you know, he was missing most of his uh, fingers down to those knuckles and his thumb. So they had three little stubs. And when he took the card to see where I was going to go, I saw those stubs you know, stubbed fingers. And I thought, oh my God, you know, he must have been in an accident, you know, in construction or something. You know, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt rather than saying, oh, how did you get your fingers stopped off? Mm -hmm. And so anyway, we're driving. So the next thing I know, we're not going left. We're going right again, a hundred miles an hour. And I said, no, 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 no hotel, no, air no airport, hotel, please. Por favor, take me back to the hotel. And um, he just keeps going and going 100 miles an hour on the freeway. And <clears throat> um, I realize I've been kidnapped. And so I'm uh, rolling up. Uh, I'm trying to get out of the cab. I'm smashing a little par partition. I'm crying. I'm, my nose is running into my mouth. I'm, you know, 
screaming at him, take me back to the hotel. Nothing, no response. And so then all of a sudden we're on a blacktop road, then we're on a dirt road. And uh, he's got the cab on just the two, you know, right hand tires. So the left hand tires aren't even on the ground. And I'm trying to get out of the cab. I've got the door open. I'm, you know, pawing at the sidewalk, trying to jump. And, you know, you'd think he would notice that. And he didn't. But he pulls up in front of this uh, Quonset hut that had starving dogs in front of it. And uh, I jump out of the cab like that. <clears throat> and I run into the middle of the street, which is a dirt, red dirt street. And there are, ca- there are traffic going on the uh, highway up above the interstate. And I'm like, all right. And I'm screaming all sorts of terrible words. And I'm like, okay, come on. You touch me, some of, one of us is going to die. It might be me, but one of us will die. And um, out of the darkness of this Quonset hut, this man appears, this er- very elegantly dressed man. And uh, it's like 1030 in the morning. And uh, he looks at me and the noise that I'm making and I'm digging up clouds of red dust. And he just quietly says, take this one back. Like I'm a fish, you know, throw this one back. It's not, you know, it's not big enough. It's not what we want. So, so he sent the cab driver out to get another one. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, the cab driver drove me back to the hotel. And then um, I was not left alone again for another minute at that convention. If I had not stood up and said, you know, one of us will die, it might be me, but one of us will die. Uh, If I didn't have that posture, I I probably wouldn't be here today. In many ways, isn't it? You've got to have that fighting spirit to get through all of it, obviously in that instance. And I imagine in, in so many as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been a fighter all my life and, um, I I don't have to be anymore. Yeah. And so I'm learning that from my husband too. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Oh yeah. Well, that sounds like a crazy journey to the tattoo convention. Um, yeah, I wish that there was people with you on that journey, but I'm glad that you managed to fight your way out of it and that they they decided to take you back. I think I would have been scared to get back in a taxi cab with someone like that, but I'm glad you got safe and everyone kept you supported after. Well, you have to look at the, uh, you have to balance it. You know, I didn't speak Spanish. There were no pay phones on the corners. I know there were no street signs on the corner. I had no idea where I was in the world's biggest city. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, the guy was uh, pleasant after he was just doing a job. He was just gathering girls for sex trafficking wow. or kidnapping ransom. You know, the thing is when you, they ransom you and your family gives up everything they have to get you back you never come back yeah okay yeah oh i'm so glad you're safe (laughs) me too i am i'm safe yeah i'm very safe now yeah did you do well at the convention despite that did you go back oh yeah is that day oh yeah i asked when i went back to the convention i said where's the nearest bar and they (laughs) sent me down to the corner and i've had like two double shots of tequila and a bowl of menudo and I washed all the red dirt off of me that I'd kicked up. And then I was there and all the guys like wandered in, hung over. And I already had like 300 bucks in my pocket. Wow. Already had a kidnapping and $300 worth of tattooing before <laughs> I turned up. Wow. That's a good day. <laughs> yeah. That is a good day. <laughs> Fully resolved. Turn that one around. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Oh, I'm so impressed by your stories. Um, yeah, I think it was different times that you grew up in tattooing through than than I did. I'm fortunate to have not experienced things like that. And um, I think it's people like you paving the way for my generation. It's really opened up doors to women in tattooing. I think it's still a challenge. There's still a lot of prejudice and obviously a lot yeah. of inequality. Like things are better, but it's not 
it's not completely balanced. So I just really appreciate your work and yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with your stories. Thank you. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm so glad that you're feeling a bit better and on the recovery as well. Yeah, keep yeah, that, about your wellness. That'd be terrible to be taken out by COVID after, you know, surviving kidnapping and, you yeah, know, exactly. in Mexico City. Weren't you ice climbing off a mountain and fell into a crevasse yeah. as well? Um, yeah, yeah. I was climbing the face of a glacier uh, in Utah mountains. I was at 17,000 feet and uh, I fell 350 feet or 300 feet. The length of a football field, straight down, glass, and then flew off the crevasse and into the crevasse and then all the snow that I disturbed kicking and screaming and begging Jesus to throw me a rope uh, and you know embedded me and uh, and I compression fractured four of my vertebrae my, my lumbar vertebrae I used to be 510 and I'm now 54 wow so that's how much shrinkage of my uh my vertebrae have, ha have uh, taken. Yeah. Wow. There's still a lot of life in me, though. So. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm not 78 years old. <laughs> I feel like I'm. <laughs> I feel like I'm. You know, 25. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you yeah. still have all the passion and drive that you had at 25 as well. Yeah, it doesn't. A lot of it doesn't leak out now, but yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh. I, I love life. Life is a gift and friends are a gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I've been exceedingly lucky, exceedingly lucky in my life. And uh, meeting the right people, uh, having avenues open to me that would not have uh, generally been open to me. And uh, yeah, I, I have just been extremely lucky in my in every way yeah you've had a wonderful life it sounds like so many stories in there and from the ones I've heard I'm just like wow so so impressed and yeah thank you for sharing those with me I really appreciate all of your knowledge and experience oh thank you Fade yeah, yeah well let's go go make some new ones let's yeah. go make some new stories yeah. you've got some pretty good stories yourself sailing yeah. across the Pacific and <laughs> you know did you see that little easter um island head on my yeah the little icon yeah the little cute? Emoji. yeah the moai emoji yeah 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 i was i, I guess i didn't really speak to you since i went sailing not enough anyway so yeah not i got really moai and i got to see the back pieces that are engraved into the moai not all of them but a lot of them they have the tattoos that were you know, like a portrait of the person they were carved of. So Moai is not even the right translation. It's something like Aringa, Aringaroa Tetepuna, which is like the face of the ancient people. So these stone heads wow. were a, a carving of a full body with all the tattoos. And yeah, I think that there's not been enough documented around that. I went into not archives, at all. archives from 1915 from Catherine Rutilich and looked at her photography and documentation. And that's where I discovered the tattooing. So there was nothing on the internet about it other than that. So I flew there to find out for myself. Um, yeah, I can't wait to share with you the book and story from that journey as well. I'll send you a copy so you can read it while you're getting well. Okay, I'd love that. Yeah, I'll email that to you this afternoon, Kate. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, those are adventures that I would love to have, to go to Borneo, to go to uh, New Guinea, you know, those places that are really the, the heartbeat of all of our cultures, all of our essences, you know, <clears throat> and uh, those, are the, those are holy trips to me. That's what I would like to do, so. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see the Sailor Jerry tattoo machines. So let me know when I can oh, read yeah. your life story in a book and get one of those machines. And um, okie dokie. Yeah. 
I'll look forward to coming to visit as well. We'll make a movie. Yes, let's do that. Oh, thank you so much for speaking with me today, Kate. Well, I love you and thank you for everything that you do for oh, the history you. of tattooing <laughs> and, you know, the role of women in it. I mean, it's, 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 it's got to be done. It's important work and I'm so happy you're doing it. Thank you, Kate. I look forward to sharing with you my book and hear what you think. I'll be able to walk you through my little stories. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I've I've loved your little I've loved your films and I've loved everything that you do so far. So thank you, Kate. You too. You're my hero. <laughs> uh, okay, I love you like a daughter, darling. Okay. Well, you too. Bye, Kate. <laughs> Bye, Bye, sweetheart. Bye. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. <laughs> and you. I'll speak to you okay. soon. Bye.